Good morning, church. Good to have you guys here this morning. We're doing things a little bit different this morning, so we're going to be hooking up on Facebook Live. Are you on Facebook Live? Hey, Facebook family, it's good to have you. Let us know that you're here by liking, or if you watch it later, hashtag replay so that we can connect with you because you are just as much as part of this house in there than you are if you are here. So anyways, we're going to go ahead and open a prayer and then we're going to have worship. Father God, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and as we enter into worship, Father, we just come before you and lay at your feet. And just to honor you, Father God, for who you are, Father God, because you are a God that loves us so much. And we are so thankful and grateful, Father God, that you sent your son to die for us. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory. Holy Spirit, we say have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Altars are open during worship, as always, if you feel like. Good morning. Thank you for having us. We are so honored and blessed to be here with you guys. Are you ready to worship Jesus together? Yeah. Let's do it.
Amen. He has done great things Amen. for us. Amen. As we get into this next song, I encourage you to just get into an, an attitude of prayer and of worship and lift your hands and receive whatever it is that the Lord has for you today.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Are you guys glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yeah. Man, if you guys could just raise your hand. Let's, let, let's continue this, this, this attitude of worship. Father God, Lord, we thank you for a place to come, God, as a family. Lord, to come together in one accord to worship you, Father. Our long-suffering God, Lord, that you would love us so much, Father, to send your son Jesus to die for us, Lord. And as the song says, you made a way where there was no way, Father. So, Lord, we come to you this morning, and we worship you, Father, and we thank you for this opportunity to come together in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Hi. 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 How's everybody doing? Good. Great. Good morning. Man, it was good to have live music, yeah. wasn't it? Amen. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Good. Uh, I'm not going to get too lengthy this morning, but we're going to collect the tithes and offerings. Um, I just want to thank you guys for continuing to give and, and continuing to be faithful. It's been a crazy two years. Yeah. It's been a crazy two years, and this church has continued to give and support the work that's going on. We've been able to make some some uh, renovations, and we're, we've got some materials to do some more renovations, and that's Praise all God. because you guys Hallelujah. have continued to honor God and continue to support the work that he's doing here. Amen. So if the ushers want to go ahead and pass the bag, I'm going to pray over the offering. Father God, Lord, I thank you for the seed that's being sown today, Father, for, for, for the gifts that, and, and the givers that, that are continuing to support, Father, your work, continuing to support what you're doing here to preach the gospel and get the word of, 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 the word of salvation out to each and every person in this valley, Father. So God, we love you and we thank you. I ask that you bless each and every person. Amen. Amen. And then... What do you smile for? Because you forgot to tell him how to give. Oh! <laughs> ha, the one... <laughs> oh, my bad. Let me back up. So the one thing she asked me this morning is uh, don't forget to give the people at home watching all the different ways to give because we haven't been doing this live. And I had one job to do today. One job to do today. And you and, did it uh, well. And I totally bombed it. So uh, the, the, the first way we have to give is Zell. And uh, you can give at Zell at Family Faith Tabernacle at gmail.com. Uh, you can also write a check to Family Faith Tabernacle. You can send it to P.O. Box 1540, San Jacinto, California, 92581. And then we also have text to give where you can send the dollar amount to 843-21. And then the church center app at Family Faith Tabernacle Church of God. Venmo, is that new? Yes. And we got Venmo at familyfaithtabernacle at gmail.com. So for all of you watching at home, I'm sorry I, I jumped the gun, but you, you can give that one too. So. <laughs> hey, one job. I'm going to keep announcements uh, really uh, short this morning because... Uh, we want to give uh, Pastor Josh as much time as we can, so um, I just want to remind you that we do have dinners with our neighbors coming up on May 13th. Please see Reverend Jenny um, to sign up and let her know if you want to donate food towards that or you want to come and help her um, do that. We um, invited all the neighbors on Easter when we gave them their Easter basket, so... Um, again, it's just to get to know them. We're not going to beat them over the head with the word. We're just going to welcome them over for some dinner and some fellowship. Amen. And then um, don't forget Bishop Sean O'Neill is coming to um, have a celebration service on May 22nd. This is going to make us official no longer a church plant. Amen. I don't exactly understand it, but it's a good thing, and it's a celebration. <laughs> so um, anyways... So at this time, I'm just going to let you kind of tell you a little bit about Pastor Josh. Um, he's married. His wife's name is Amy. She's a beautiful um, woman of God right there. And they have two sons. Um, their name is Logan and Grayson. And um, they pastor the church, the church, Inland Empire. I think that's an awesome, cool name. He just renamed it. And uh, so they're in the Inland Empire. They're in Ontario and in Corona. Um he pastors the church where Pastor John and I met and got married. So you, you'll hear me talk. You guys have heard me talk about that church quite a bit. So um, they are very proud of their boys, and they love them. I just saw that they're one of them or two of them are playing football. Yeah, yeah they're going to be playing football, so that's pretty cool. So Pastor Josh is an ordained bishop in the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. 
He has been in full-time ministry for over 18 years and started practice, participating in missions work, practicing, participating in missions work at the age of 12. For three and a half years, he served as an associate pastor and pastor of students ministry for both New Beginnings Christian Fellowship in Montclair, California, and for the Gate Christian Fellowship in Corona. He then served as a state evangelist for the California Nevada Church of God. His evangelism missionary ministry has taken him over 19 countries, wow, and throughout the United States, ministering at conferences, Winterfest, and semin seminaries globally. He has also served and currently serves on several boards for the California Nevada Church of God, including the California Nevada State Council, the California Nevada State Youth and Evangelism Board, the Examination Committee, the California Nevada Missions Board, and the Mission California Board. Furthermore, he currently serves as the District Overseer for both San Bernardino and Riverside County. He is officially our overseer. So I'm excited for you guys to meet him. I know you guys can really talk about him, but um, now you're going to get to meet him and hear him minister, as well as being the lead pastor at the Church Inland Empire for the past 13 years. Pastor Josh serves as the director over lead pastors in North America for the Never Before Project with Dr. Michael Knight and sits on the university board for IMLD out of Scotland, UK. Additionally, he has re received a master's degree of theology and biblical studies with an emphasis in biblical languages and he plans on pursuing his PhD next year. Oh, you're going to have your hands full. So come on up. This is our Pastor Josh. It's so good to have you here today. I can see you here. Oh, you have your hand. Okay. How's everybody doing today? Good. 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 It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Yes, amen. I want to thank Pastor Don for allowing me this opportunity to be able to minister here. I remember being in this building three, three and a half years ago or so. And we were looking at purchasing this building for the Church of God. And it's wonderful to see it all coming together and the work and the leadership of Pastor John and Pastor Don and seeing this through. And it's been an amazing thing to be able to see from distance and now to be able to witness it <laughs> firsthand here. So thank you for being so supportive of your pastor. And I know that this church is going to be packed out over and over again because of her leadership that is going forth from this building. I do want to thank the ones that are with me today. Um, it's good when you can have your family come with you to church yeah. and to travel, and they're willing to pay over $6 a gallon because they love you. <laughs> and so I have with me the Cusman family, Mike Longridge and Brennan Cavanaugh. Mike and Otto and Brennan are my brothers. And so I have literally... I've known them, I've known Mike 20-something years, and Otto 20-something years, and Brendan now 20-something years. So uh, Karen, Otto's wife, who's my children's director at the church, has known me my whole life. She was in my dad's youth group, and I've got to know her daughter, who's now my worship pastor, her whole life. And so it's, it's wonderful to have family with me, and so from the pulpit, I want to thank you guys thank for you. being with me today since my wife has the two boys at the house, so I thought I'd bring family with me. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Today I'm going to be looking at midnight. That term, that word, midnight. And what we see in Acts chapter 16. You see, the Apostle Paul, on his missionary journeys, sought to proclaim the gospel in places that it would have the farthest reaching effect. Namely, he would go to large cities or, or into trade centers as he administered the gospel. He also sought out people which he would have some commonality with and thus a, a receptivity, really, to his message. Those people were mainly Jews or God-fearing Gentiles who worshipped together in the local synagogue. The apostle was not only very intelligent, he was very strategic. He was very strategic as a minded person of what he wanted to do and how the gospel should go forth. He sought the direction and the insight and the power of God in everything that he did. See, after being resisted by the Spirit from going further into Asia, he then goes and he travels to Macedonia and thus Philippi, 
based upon the revelation that he receives in Acts chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. Philippi, at this time, was one of the leading cities in all of the region. I love the city of Philippi. It's one of my favorite cities that I've ever been to in Greece. When you're actually there, I don't know if you guys traveled to inland, you know, further in the Inland Empire. I grew up in Corona. And so it reminded me so much of Corona because you have the backdrop of the hills. And when I was a kid growing up in Corona, you had orange trees, kind of like what I'm wearing today. And every morning you could smell the oranges in the morning. And then when I was in Philippi, we're standing on the hill right there and you just look and it looked like Corona used to look when I first moved there when there's only 40,000 people and not 150,000 people. And, and when the orange trees were in the background, but the only difference was it was all these olive trees everywhere. And it was just a beautiful sight to see. This is the city that the Apostle Paul goes to. It, it was a city that was named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip II of Macedonia. It was a Roman colony. It was independent of governmental and administrative structure. It enjoyed really the same legal rights as the other Italian cities. Philippi also had a large number of Roman legionnaires that had retired into this region. And so it's very economic and cultural and political prominence of the Roman Empire here in Greece. The first convert to Christianity in Europe was a woman named Lydia, who was a businesswoman of really considerable beings, who was honestly seeking the worship of the God of Israel. Thus, she was a prime candidate for the Apostle Paul to receive the salvation of God into her lives so that she could influence those that she was around. As we begin reading today in verse 16, Paul faces an intense power encounter with darkness. His actions turn the city into turmoil, and it goes and it lands the Apostle Paul and Silas in jail. So Acts chapter 16, verse 16, in the NIV, it says this. Once when we were going to a place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners for, by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. Verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns <coughs> to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into the house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we get into your word today, I pray, Lord God, Lord, open up our hearts, open up our minds, and open up our ears to be able to receive your word. Lord, speak your word to us so that you could speak your word through us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Look at verse 25 again. And in the voice, I love how the voice puts it because it's so poetic. It says this. It says, picture this. It's midnight. It's midnight. In the darkness of their cell, Paul and Silas, after surviving the severe beating, aren't moaning and groaning. They're praying and they're singing hymns to God. The prisoners in the adjoining cells are wide awake, listening to them pray and sing. At what? At midnight. Midnight. Midnight is a combination of two words. Mid and night. It is the middle of the night. You see, every single person experiences midnight. We all experience midnight. Midnight is when a mother begins to worry about their child being out too late. Midnight is when the doctor says there's nothing else that we can do for that. Midnight is when you stand at the graveside of that loved one and you try to imagine a life without them. Midnight is when you've done your best in the service of the Lord and it all seemingly feels for naught. Midnight is when you've given your life to a ministry, when you've given your life to a career, when you've given your life to a cause, only to find out that it's seemingly coming to an end at that moment. Midnight is when you're so tired that you can't sleep. Midnight is when you're so thirsty that you can't drink. Midnight is when you're so discouraged that you can't think, so you can't hurt, you can't move, you can't do anything. You are so broken that you can't even stand up. That's midnight. Midnight. It's when it's the darkness. Midnight is when you've been treated unfairly. Paul and Silas just brought deliverance in the life of a slave girl, and they were stripped, they were beaten, and they were thrown into jail for it. See, midnight is when you've done everything to obey God and found only persecution and difficulty. Midnight is when a pandemic hits and it affects your family, it affects your friends, it affects everybody that you come into contact with, it affects your nation, and it affects the nations of the world. Midnight is when you feel like the walls are closing in on you and there is no hope for tomorrow. Midnight is when the night is so bleak and there is no light to be able to guide you out of it. Midnight is not some necessarily something that is caused. However, something that you're experiencing. Midnight comes to all. Midnight comes to everybody. If you've ever lived life, then you've experienced midnight. If you've never experienced midnight, then you've never really lived life yet. Because we all have that midnight. Everyone experiences it. So then the question comes up, what do we do at midnight? What do you do at midnight? What are you to do? Number one, if you're taking notes today, and I apologize, I didn't have time to copy off a handout, but number one is this. At midnight, find a friend. Midnight, find a friend. It was who? Paul and Silas. That's good. Paul and Silas, Acts 16, 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas. When Christ sends out, the 12, and then the 72. He sent them in what? Pairs. They'd go as a team. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 3. 1 through 3 in the voice, it says this. The Lord then recruited and deployed 70 more disciples. He sent them ahead in teams of two to visit all the towns and settlements between them and Jerusalem. This is what he ordered, Jesus speaking. There's a great harvest waiting in the fields, but there aren't many good workers to harvest it. Pray that the harvest master will send out good workers to the fields. It's time for you, 70, to go. I'm sending you out armed with vulnerability, like lambs walking into a pack of wolves. You see, this requires a peer. There are to be no lone rangers in the church. We have to partner with each other. We all need help. And if you're that arrogant that you don't think you need help, then you need to go seek the Lord because you're lying to yourself. We all need help. We need somebody to come alongside of us. Remember Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12, in the voice it says this, Two are better than one because a good return comes when two work together. If one of them falls, the other can help him up. But who will help the pitiful person who falls down alone? In the same way, 
If two lie down together, they can keep each other warm. But how will the one who sleeps alone stay warm against the night? And if one person is vulnerable to attack, two can drive the attacker away. As the saying goes, a rope made of three strands is not quickly broken. Remember, where there are two, though, there are three. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 says, For wherever two or three come together in honor of my name, I am right there with them. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> at midnight, we find a friend. Number two, at midnight, say a prayer. Yeah. <clears throat> midnight, say a prayer. Pray. What were they doing? Acts 16, 25, about midnight, they were praying. They were praying. You see, at midnight, we have a choice to make when we go through our midnight. Yeah. At midnight, we can go and we can worry. We can complain. We can talk bad. We can get in a pit of despair. We can say, oh, Lord, you weren't there for me. Or why wasn't this person there for me? Why wasn't that person there for me? We can do all those types of things. We can ascribe the blame of our situation and our circumstance on somebody else. Or you can call upon the name of the Lord. Oh, how good. Or you can say, Jesus, I need you yes. right now. Joel chapter 2, verse 32 in the Amplified, it says, Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered and saved. And Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you. I will tell you the great and unsearchable things you do not know. In Isaiah 55, verse 6, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Psalm chapter 27, verse 8 beautifully says this, I heard your voice in my heart. Come seek my face. My inner being responded, Yahweh, I'm seeking your face with all of my heart. You see, we have that choice. Are we going to blame somebody else? Yeah. yeah. Have you noticed that? That's what the world's telling you to do right now. Well, blame this person. Blame that person. Well, it's that person's fault, not mine. Right. Really? Right. I don't know. I grew up in a house where my dad said, you better man up to your own stuff. Right. What are we going to do? Are we going to say, okay, I'm in this circumstance. How am I going to get out of it? What are we going to do? Are we going to pray? Are we going to seek him? Are we going to go after him? What is it? When you call upon the name of the Lord, well, he shall be found. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 30. Or chapter 29, verse 13 says, Seek me, and you'll find me. When you seek me with your whole heart. What does the whole heart mean? I don't know. I've, I've noticed in my generation, the one following, we don't like to do anything wholeheartedly anymore. <laughs> one of the laziest generations. We always do it halfway because it's good enough. The Lord says, Don't do it halfway with me. Seek me. Seek me. Go after me, and you'll find me. Yeah. Keep going. Keep searching. Keep wanting. Yeah. When I was going for my wife, I didn't just call her one time. <laughs> right. I didn't go on just one date and go, oh, let's get married. We got married fast, but not that fast. <laughs> I was seeking her. I was bugging her. I was texting her while she was working. I said, hey, are you free now? When you get off work, let's go do something. I want to hang out with you. I want to be around you. This is what God's saying too. If you want the presence of the Lord in your life, then you better seek him and find him and go after him. Don't right. stop. Keep seeking. Keep searching. Keep reaching Hallelujah. for him right. and he will meet you in your midnight. Yes. Amen. But you have to go for it. At midnight, Amen. find a friend. Yeah. At midnight, say a prayer. Number three, at midnight, sing a song. Sing a song. Acts 16, 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing. Praying and singing. You see, at midnight, the enemy tries to taunt us. Mm -hmm. Tries to say certain things to us. And he'll even use certain people to say those things. He'll use Christian people yep, amen. to say those things. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me, I know. I am a pastor's kid. I'm the grandson of a pastor. <laughs> I think I counted 26 members of my family are pastors. Wow. Guess what I didn't want to be? Was a pastor. <laughs> 
Two reasons. First one, I wanted to actually make money. You don't really do that as a pastor unless you're <laughs> one of those corrupt guys. <laughs> Number two, people are mean. Yeah. They are flat out yeah. mean. I've been preaching and teaching since I was 12 years old. And no matter what, somebody has a complaint every Sunday morning. <laughs> That's why I hide before church starts. <laughs> Nobody sees me till like five minutes till. And I make sure to make a line to the front so nobody can stop me to complain. I had to get after my counsel. I said, hey, Sunday mornings is ministry time. If you have something that we got to work on or something that we have to complain about, you want to complain about me, there's Monday through Friday. Don't talk to me on Sunday about it because we're not here to make complaints. We're here to minister to the people that are walking through those doors. That's why we're here. The enemy uses even people that you think are the most holy people. Yeah. Even they can get a little craw. <laughs> just leave it at that. Psalm 137, verse 3, the message says this. That's where our captors demanded songs, sarcastic and mocking. Sing us a happy Zion song. Sing us a happy Zion song. You see, at midnight, we have another choice to make. We can dwell in despair and we can wallow in our condition or we can declare that God is worthy of worship because he is great yes, and he yes. is greatly to be praised. Amen. Amen. Psalm 145 verse 3 says the eternal is great and deserves endless praise. His greatness knows no limit, recognizes no boundary. No one can measure or comprehend his magnificence. First Thessalonians. In chapter 5, verse 18, the Apostle Paul writes to the believers in Thessaloniki. He says this, and in the midst of everything, be always giving thanks. For this is God's perfect plan for you in Christ. You see, at midnight, worship reminds us that not only is God great, but that God loves us. Yes. That he loves us. Even when we're going through the hardest times, he still loves us. Zephaniah 3.17 in the Living Bible says this, For the Lord your God has arrived to live among you. He is a mighty Savior. He'll give you victory. He will rejoice over you with great gladness. He will love you and not accuse you. Is that a joyous choir I hear? No, it's the Lord himself exulting over you in a happy song. This is one of my favorite scriptures, and I'm sure Mike and Otto and them are tired of hearing it because I use it so much at church because I love this, and especially this version. It says, is that a joyous choir I hear? No, it's the Lord himself exulting over you in a happy song. I brought this up to my church last week at Easter. I said, when I was a child, every night, my daddy would sing over me and my brother and my sister. And his simple song, Daddy loves you, and I'll always be there for you. Daddy loves you, and I'll always be there for you. If my earthly daddy sings that song to me and tells me how much he loves me, how much he cares about me, how much more my Abba Father, my creator of the universe, looks down upon me and says, Daddy loves you. Daddy loves you. And Daddy will always be there for you. Amen. He sings it how? Salting over you yeah. in a happy song. He's always smiling. No matter how many stupid things we do, yes, thank you, Jesus. that daddy still loves you yeah. and he's still singing over you. <laughs> it's here at midnight that we offer a sacrifice of praise. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, and the voice says this Through Jesus, then let us keep offering to God our own sacrifice, the praise of lips that confess his name without ceasing. Psalm chapter 42, verse 5 and 6. In the passion says this, so then my soul, why would you be depressed? Why would you sink into despair? Just keep hoping and waiting on God, your savior, for no matter what, I will sing, still sing with praise, for you are my saving grace. Here I am depressed and downcast, yet I'll still remember you as I ponder the places your glory streams down from the mighty mountaintops, lofty and majestic, the mountains of your awesome presence. 
Remember what Jonah did in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1 and 9, where it says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord as God, but I will sing a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Remember what Job said after he lost his wife, or he lost his children, he lost everything that he had. He had boils on his skin, his wife turned his back on him. He said this, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end, he will stand on the earth. No matter what the enemy tries to throw at me, my God is still God, and I'm going to go Amen. after him. Amen. Amen. Midnight, we find a friend. Midnight, we say a prayer. Midnight, we sing a song. Number four, at midnight, we share your faith. Share your faith, excuse me. Gets you wings. <laughs> Acts sixteen twenty five says this. Picture this. It's midnight. In the darkness of their cell, Paul and Silas, after surviving the severe beating, aren't moaning and groaning. They're praying and singing hymns to God. The prisoners in adjoining cells are wide awake, listening to them pray and sing. At midnight. At midnight, the innocent and the guilty, the godly and the wicked are all in the same place. They're all in that same cell. The other prisoners were doing what? They were listening. They are listening to Paul and Silas. You see, the power of our faith is not by the messages that we preach from the pulpit. The power of our faith is when we're walking through that valley of the shadow of death yeah. and others are watching us and how we walk. Yeah. Amen. That's the power of our faith. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 in the Passion says this, they conquered him completely through the blood of the lamb and through the powerful word of his testimony. They triumphed because they did not love <coughs> and cling to their own lives, even when faced with death. Second Corinthians 1 and 4 in the Good News Translation, says he helps us in all our troubles so that we're able to help others who have all kinds of troubles using the same help that we ourselves have received from God. Philippians 4.9 says, keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. My grandpa, I was thinking of him this week because I was watching a war movie. He served over 20 years in the military. He's passed away last year. He's one of those guys that you call a man's man. He was a man's man. He did special forces and all that. And as I was thinking of him this week, I was remembering the way he prayed. He went through a lot. Just a few years ago, we saw the house that him and his four brothers and his parents grew up in, less than 600 square feet. As they worked the fields in Modesto. And he served in the military all those years. He lost his daughter when she was four years old. And I was thinking about the last time that he prayed at Christmas. And, and this man who was so big and so strong, I'm the little guy in the family. These guys are all over six foot at one time. And he was, he's so strong, was now in a wheelchair. But he would pray this every time. He began a prayer. He said, Lord, you've been so good to me. Lord, you've been so good to me. No matter what he went through, Lord, you're so good. That's faith. Yeah. That's faith. I remember my dad when my mom passed away on my birthday nine years ago. But he said, God is still God, and he is good. That's faith. That's faith that has to rise up in all of us. You see, we must trust the Lord. For trust is the Hebrew concept of faith. And trusting faith, which weaves its way through the fabric of our life, begins to create a beautiful tapestry of both confidence and ordering your steps. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, in the message it says this, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. 
Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who'll keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. This is a simple question of faith. Do you trust God? Do you trust him? Are you confident in his ability? Do you believe in his goodness? Do you trust his word, both his promises and his commands? Even in the darkest hours, Jeremiah 29, 11 in the message says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. Then act on that. Act on it if you really trust him. Live your life accordingly as a life of faith. Ephesians 4, 1 says, live a life worthy of the calling you've received. The apostle James wrote in James 1, 2, and 4, don't run from tests and hardships, brothers and sisters. As difficult as they are, you'll, you will ultimately find joy in them. If you embrace them, your faith will blossom under pressure and teach you true patience as you endure. And true patience brought on by endurance will equip you to complete the long journey and cross the finish line, mature, complete, and wanting nothing. You see, transformation is always the ultimate goal of faith. It is at the point where our learning produces a familiarity within us into the character of Christ, transforming us into his likeness. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, Now stay focused on Jesus, who designed and perfected our faith. He endured the cross and ignored the shame and the death because he focused on the joy that was set before him. And now he's seated beside God in the throne, a place of honor. You see, faith itself must never be relegated to the church, to a chapel, or a theology classroom, or even a prayer chapel. Faith is a part of the human condition. It's given by God. It is stirred up by His Spirit. It is activated by His Word. And it's demonstrated by His people. But it's all a gift of humanity. To quote my dad, Dr. Toby Montgomery, he said this, Faith is a decision. It's not an emotion. Faith is not the absence of doubt any more than courage is the absence of fear. Faith is a decision to not be governed by doubt. You see, from faith spring the great transformational graces of hope and love. Faith itself not only moves mountains, but it changes hearts. Faith allows the blind to see, for the sinner to become a saint, the pauper to become a king, and the foolish to become wise. It is faith that is a portion to every human being that allows a researcher to seek out a cure for a deadly disease, or an engineer to build that new great city, or for Apple to come up with a new product that you just have to have. <laughs> all of that is faith. It's all faith, and it's a gift from God that allows us, even those who would deny its value, the ability to see into the unknown and dream the impossible. You see, it's faith that allows us to hold two contradictory realities simultaneously and still know that all things are possible. Jesus said in Mark 9, 23, everything is possible for the person who has faith. I love this quote by Robert F. Kennedy. He said this, some men see things as they are, and ask why. I dream of things that never were. And ask why not? Why not? You see, it's faith that caused Moses to see another reality when the children of Israel were pinned between an Egyptian army and a Red Sea. It's faith that caused Joshua to see another reality when the mighty Jordan River and the fortress of Jericho stood tall. It's faith that caused Job to see another reality when he lost his children, he lost his wealth, he lost his health, and he still says, I know that my Redeemer lives. It's faith that caused David to see another reality when a giant stood before him. It's faith that says, Lazarus is dead, but I'm going to go wake him up. It's yeah. faith Amen. that says to Jairus, I know you're little girl just died but hold on don't be afraid yeah. just believe faith says that our nation can be changed that people can actually love each other that the world can be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God it is faith that dreams faith that sees faith that hopes faith that believes faith that imagines it is faith that believes that tomorrow's going to be a better day and by God's grace it's within our grasp Amen. Amen. that's what faith does you see faith it's not the language of the whiner. Faith is not the currency of the complainer. Faith is not the servant of the selfish. But faith is the engine of the dreamer. 
It is the hope of the sinner. And it's the power of the believer. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11, 1 in the New Living says, faith is the confidence that we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. It was faith that will change people's lives. At midnight, find a friend, say a prayer, sing a song, share your faith. And number five, at midnight, expect God to act. Expect God to act. Amen. Hallelujah. Acts 16, 25 and 26 says this. Picture this. It's midnight in the darkness of their cell. Paul and Silas have survived severe beatings. Aren't moaning and groaning, they're praying and singing hymns to God. The prison and the adjoining cells are wide awake, listening to them pray and sing. Suddenly the ground begins to shake and the prison foundations begin to crack. You can hear the sound of jangling chains and the squeak of cell doors opening. Every prisoner realizes that his chains have come unfastened. You see, at midnight, expect the infinite, boundless God of all possibilities to do the unexpected and the miraculous. Isaiah 40, verse 31, and the voices with those who trust in the eternal one will regain their strength. They'll soar on wings as eagles. They'll run, never tired, never winded, never weary. They'll walk, never tired, never faint. Psalm 40, verse 1 and 3, or 1 through 3 says this. I waited and waited and waited some more, patiently knowing God would come through for me. Then at last he bent down and listened to my cry. He stooped down to lift me out of danger from the desolate pit I was in and the muddy mess I'd fallen into. Now he's lifted me up into a firm, secure place and steadied me while I walk along his ascending path. Verse 3, a new song for a new day rises up in every time. I think about how he breaks through for me. Ecstatic praises pours out of my mouth until everyone hears how God has set me free. Many will see his miracles. They'll stand in awe of God and fall in love with him. Finally, number six. Midnight is when tomorrow ends, or today ends and tomorrow begins. Midnight's when today ends and tomorrow begins. The yeah, Acts 16, 25 through 26, verse 35. You have Paul and Silas in there, they're singing, they're praising God. God moves and God reacts. They become free in verse 35. It says, at the dawn, the city officials send the police to the jailer's home with a command, let those men go free. Remember my friends, midnight is when today ends and tomorrow <coughs> begins. Midnight's not yet dawn, but it isn't yesterday anymore. All the pain, all the suffering that you went through in your yesterdays is in your yesterdays. Right. Because today is a new day. And tomorrow will be a new day. But the God that saw you through your pain and your sorrows of your yesterdays will be the God that will be with you, walking beside you as you move forward in hell. Psalm 30, verse 5. Erica, Mike, we come up. So we may weep through the night, but at daybreak, we'll turn into shouts of ecstatic joy. Philippians 1, 6 is being confident of this, that he who began a good work on you will carry it into completion until the final day of Christ Jesus. I love what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, who was a young pastor. He said this to him at his end. For the which cause I also suffered these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed. I know in whom I believe. Being confident of what? I know who I believe in. My God has carried me this far, and I know he'll carry me the rest of the way. Amen. If God has got me this far through this pandemic and these other things that life has thrown at me, he could see me through everything else that the enemy tries to throw at me. Will you stand with me? Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. It says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest requests, your most unbelievable dreams, and exceed your wildest imagination. He'll outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Verse 21, 
Now we offer up to God all the glory and praise that rises from every church in every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. Amen. First off, with every head bowed and every eye closed, with no one looking around right now, I'll not embarrass you at all. Maybe you're in here today and you say, you know what, Pastor, I don't want to wipe that slate clean. I need to start over with the Lord. Maybe you're in here and you just don't know Jesus at all and you want to accept him into your life. If either one of those things are you, I will not embarrass you at all. But if that's you, just raise your hand where you're at and God will meet you. Today in Jesus' name. I want to accept Jesus. I need to wipe that slate clean. I want to start over with him. I need that refreshness. Lord, I pray for great grace and great mercy. We're going to have the worship team lead us in a song. If you're in here today, you say, you know what, Pastor? I'm going through my midnight right now. I need the Lord to walk with me in my midnight right now. I need to call upon him. I need, I, need, I need to pray to him. I need to sing to him. I need to have faith right now as I walk through this midnight. If that's you, and you're willing to step down in faith and pray together, I'm just here to stand in the gap and pray with you because we're two or three are gathered. There I am, says the Lord. So as they lead us in song and you want prayer, just come on down. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of you are. Lord, if we may be going through a midnight, it may yes. seem bleak right now, but Father, help us to get through to the other side, knowing that dawn is coming, the morning is yes. coming, yes. and Hallelujah. today will be gone yes. soon, and there is a new morning coming in Jesus' name. Father, be with your people. Minister to this church. Lord, I pray for a great expansion yes. Yes. like never before. Send people in from the north and from the south, from the east and from the west, Father. Send in the right leaders to come alongside Pastor Don to help be an Aaron and a her to lift up her hands, Father. Lord, you've already given her a Joshua and others, Father, in the name of Jesus at this church. Lord, help them to win this city, to win this region for you, Father. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for this church that each and every day give them ears to hear the gentle whisper of your voice. Give them eyes to see the fields that are ripe for the harvest. Lord, put a filter over their mouth so that comes out of their mouth is of you and not of them. Lord, let their hands be extended for your kingdom. And let their feet be anointed. Yes, yes. So every place they set their foot is one by you and for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Thank you, Pastor Josh. That was a good word. Amen. Y'all may be seated for just a minute. I hope this was you. Um, I don't know about you, but I know what I'm meditating on this week. That whole list of scriptures that he, he gave. Man, every time he read a scripture, I was like, oh, that's for me. Oh, that's for me. Oh, that's for me. And I'm going to take them and I'm going to meditate on them this week. And I encourage you to do the same. Because if you're not leaving this place refreshed, you missed it. Yep. If you're not leaving this place like bold like a lion feeling that no matter what, God's got you even in your midnight hour, yeah. you missed the message. So you can always rewatch it on our Facebook if you want to go back and, and hear it. I pray that you all caught it. I know I caught it. I know Robbie caught it. I know Jen caught it. <laughs> I can hear him. So it was a timely word, and that's what, exactly what I was praying for is that you would give us a timely word and it was a timely word for our season i believe and so um, thank you so much for coming thank your team yes. for coming and traveling so far i know and we're not just around the corner but um i'm honored to have pastor josh as my overseer as my um, supervising pastor with my schooling and with my pastor he's my pastor he's who i could go to and um so I'm honored. I'm glad you all got to meet him. Before you leave here today, hug someone's neck, meet somebody new, and I hope to see you guys all on Wednesday night. Don't forget, Bible study and youth right here. God bless.